Section 10 of Early Greek Philosophy by Alfred William Benn. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 4 The Sophists, Part 1. 1. Education at Athens. Speculative freedom, complete everywhere else in the Hellenic world, was, as we have seen, not complete at Athens but in that city which called herself the school of greece education always remained free to this extent at least that it was a matter of individual enterprise although in other ways sufficiently absorbing and despotic the state neither provided the means of instruction nor did it attempt to prescribe what the course of instruction should be apparently any one that liked could open a school and fathers could send their sons to any school they liked. The system seems to have worked well. Every Athenian citizen could read to some extent, and it was considered rather disreputable not to read well. Boys of the higher classes were also taught to write, to play on the lyre, and to repeat a good deal of poetry by heart. In the best times of the Republic, they were also trained to be hardy, obedient, and pure. In later life, some people continued to read literature besides hearing some of the greatest things that were ever written in the theater, and some of the greatest things that were ever spoken in the public assemblies. Booksellers' shops existed, and there is reason to believe that even so abstruse a work as that of Anaxagoras could be bought for a drachma a little under tenpence in our money educated women are mentioned as a class by plato in the fourth century b c and we are told that tragedies were their favourite reading as indeed of most persons which considering the austerity of the greek tragic drama shows a considerable refinement of taste what we call the higher or university education was a creation of philosophy and had only just begun to dawn in the age of Pericles. At first, young men entering on public life learned what it was essential for them to know about the world and about great affairs from some older friend to whom they were attached by ties of affectionate intimacy. Sometimes they profited also by conversing with women of genius. Under a free government, the power of speech is the surest road to success. Hence, in modern democracies, lawyers command a disproportionate share of political influence. In old Athens there was no such profession. As prosecutor or as defendant, everyone had to plead his own cause before a large, popular jury. Thus, even apart from any ambition to lead the state, Every citizen was interested in mastering the arts both of cross-examination and of continuous delivery, while to men of high birth and wealth, being marked out as special objects of attack for political opponents and blackmailers, address in using the weapons of tongue fence became even a matter of life and death. In course of time, litigants made up to some extent for the want of counsel, by employing a professional hand to write a speech for them, which they then learned by heart and delivered in court, as if it had been their own composition. This practice, however, although it might relieve the mass of Athenian citizens from the necessity of studying rhetoric as an art, left the demand for a professional training in rhetoric unaffected, as the speechwriters themselves required to be educated for their work. 2 philosophy and rhetoric philosophy as the study of things in themselves does not seem at first sight in any way related to rhetoric at least not to the rhetoric of law courts and deliberative assemblies where human interests are the subject of discussion and appeals to human passion the means adopted by a skilful speaker for making his opinions prevail it must however be borne in mind that Greek philosophy owed its origin to the schools of science, a circumstance which from the beginning brought it into connection with the practice of teaching, that it systematized the habit of taking wide views, 
so characteristic even in homer of greek eloquence that the earliest sages had something to say about man as well as about nature while their successors gave an ever greater place to the laws of life and conduct as the evolution of thought went on and finally that a knowledge of the world's secrets by raising its possessor above all petty cares interests and prejudices surrounded him with a certain halo of intellectual and moral superiority well calculated to impose on a greek audience for these reasons the two seemingly independent spheres of rhetoric and philosophy the study of words and the study of things expanded until they met and overlapped a wide range of subjects being either treated as common ground or hotly disputed between the rival teachers who regarded education from opposite points of view it was agreed that the youth of good family after he had left school needed some further training as a preparation for taking part in public or private business with credit for himself and his ancestry in other words there was a demand for the higher education and just as now it was a moot point what that education should consist of above all what place if any should be held in it by religion and morality morality more particularly occupying the very centre of the ground shared or disputed between rhetoric and philosophy not that a contemporary of aristophanes used such abstract terms as religion and morality to express his meaning but he had consecrated traditions of belief and conduct which may conveniently be summed up under these two names and which meant for him all that religion and morality mean for us three the sophists the demand for higher education called into existence a class of teachers known as sophists in modern language a sophist is one who uses fallacious arguments knowing them to be such when aristotle wrote the name bore a still more opprobrious significance for he defines it as one who reasons falsely for the sake of gain in earlier times however this was not so for pindar and herodotus use sophist in an altogether creditable sense as meaning a man of superior skill or wisdom whether he happened to be a great philosopher or an ordinary intellectual craftsman what seems to have first raised a prejudice against this originally honourable appellation was the emergence of certain persons who professed to teach wisdom and virtue in return for a substantial payment money-making as such was not thought disreputable in good greek society for even so haughtily aristocratic a poet as pindar wrote odes to order but then it must be remembered that a poem like a picture or a statue seems to possess a certain tangible reality making it a more appropriate equivalent for so much hard cash than such purely ideal values as wisdom and virtue which also are universally associated with a considerable indifference to this world's goods and this feeling would be still further strengthened by the fact that no philosopher had ever exacted a fee from his pupils again for reasons already stated that higher education which the sophists sold to rich young men always included a training in rhetoric now an athenian who was used to hear rival statesmen supporting opposite policies in the assembly and rival pleaders presenting mutually contradictory views of law and fact to the popular tribunals must have had it strongly borne in on him that while one speaker was certainly wrong each in turn managed to make it seem that he was right a clear proof that one of them at least knew the art of making the worse appear the better reason from whom could they have learned this nefarious art but from their sophist teachers and was it not scandalous that a class of persons should exist who made it their profession and a very lucrative profession also to pervert the moral principles of the community 
again as all philosophers were popularly called sophists and as all attempted to explain meteorological phenomena by other than divine agencies besides expressing more or less paradoxical opinions about the nature of things in general the paid teachers of wisdom got the credit of what the vulgar considered the impieties and absurdities of philosophy and so much being certain it was easy to believe with or without evidence that they taught their pupils to disregard every duty but the pursuit of their own private advantage four protagoras the first and most famous of the sophists was protagoras of abdera born in the year 480 bc he became a paid teacher at thirty and pursued that calling for a period of forty years with brilliant success traversing the whole breadth of the hellenic world and if we may judge from what seems to be the typical instance of athens exciting immense enthusiasm among the more enlightened classes of greek society pericles debated moral problems with him and he was employed to make laws for the athenian colony of thurii on the occasion of a later visit to the imperial city public attention was drawn to the fact that protagoras was a declared agnostic a book of his began with the words as to the gods i do not know whether they exist or not life is too short for such difficult inquiries the author was expelled from athens a herald was sent round demanding the surrender of the book from all private individuals who possessed it and the copies collected were burnt in the marketplace protagoras himself was lost at sea on his way to sicily he was then nearly seventy it may be that the treatise which gave occasion to such an outbreak of inquisitorial fanaticism had only just been written and that the words about the shortness of life refer to the very limited time during which the author might expect his own intellectual activity to continue End of section ten section eleven of early greek philosophy by alfred william ben this librivox recording is in the public domain read by pamela nagami chapter four the sophists part two five humanism judging from the scanty materials at our disposal protagoras was not only a great educator but also a great and original thinker his profession of agnosticism must be read in company with another celebrated sentence quoted from the beginning of his work on truth man is the measure of all things determining what does and what does not exist plato in his old age opposed to this the principle that god and not man is the true measure that is to say the standard of truth and good must be something ideal and beyond experience and elsewhere he has tried to reduce the human test of reality to an absurdity by identifying it with the doctrine that when two people disagree they must both be right it seems likely enough that protagoras attached great importance to individual experience and conviction to what we now call the point of view but as plato himself suggests this was not inconsistent with discriminating between one person's opinion and another's with due regard to their respective authorities and the sophist's object would be to make his pupils better judges than they were before the ultimate test of rightness being reference to human interests rather than to the oracles of problematic gods while the standard varies from man to man but with an appeal from the stupid and ignorant to the educated and intelligent it also varies between ages and nations involving a similar appeal from barbarism to civilization from a less to a more advanced stage of social progress protagoras seems to have first discovered the doctrine of human development viewing it as above all a moral growth perhaps the evolutionism of early greek science suggested this view 
according to a speech put into his mouth by plato morality is the very foundation of human life the condition of every other art the essential distinction between brutes and men between savages and civilized communities some are born with more and some with less capacity for acquiring virtue but that it is an acquisition is proved among other ways by the existence of penal law for punishment can only be justified as a deterrent from wrongdoing in other words as a moralizing agency it would appear that the method followed by protagoras as a teacher was quite in harmony with his humanist philosophy while the other sophists gave young men the sort of scientific education that age afforded that is a course of arithmetic geometry and astronomy he took them straight to ethics and politics interspersing his lectures with literary illustrations from the poets according to him the absolutely straight lines and perfect circles of geometry are fictions to which nothing in reality corresponds nor do the celestial movements exhibit that exact uniformity assumed by the astronomers six hippias the naturalist that system of scientific education from which protagoras so markedly separated himself found its most typical representative in hippias of ellis this very remarkable man seems to have originated the idea of natural law as the foundation of morality distinguishing nature from the arbitrary conventions or fashions differing according to the different times or regions in which they arise imposed by arbitrary human enactment and often unwillingly obeyed he held that there is an element of right common to the laws of all countries and constituting their essential basis he held also that the good and wise of all countries are naturally akin and should regard one another as citizens of a single state this idea was subsequently developed by the cynic and still more by the stoic schools passing from the latter to the jurists in whose hands it became the great instrument for converting roman law into a legislation for all mankind hippias set a high value on truth as a virtue preferring achilles to ulysses on account of his superior veracity perhaps it was as an exercise in pure truth that he inculcated the study of mathematics and seeing how large a part equality plays in that study also some greeks cherished it as a lesson in justice euripides may have had the method of hippias in view when he wrote the noble lines honour equality who binds together both friends and cities and confederates for equity is law law equity the lesser is the greater's enemy and disadvantaged i begins the strife from her our measures weights and numbers come defined and ordered by equality so do the night's blind eye and sun's bright orb walk equal courses in their yearly round and neither is embittered by defeat seven prodicus we sometimes find the name of prodicus associated with that of hippias as like him a somewhat younger contemporary of protagoras both taught at athens and both seem to have represented the same naturalistic tendency of thought plato it is true satirizes prodicus as a rather pedantic lecturer on the niceties of language but in this instance we probably get a juster idea of his importance from aristophanes who describes him as the most remarkable of the natural philosophers for wisdom and character and who elsewhere playfully broaches a new theory of evolution which is to send prodicus away howling we also hear of this sophist as having explained the origin of religion 
by the personification of natural objects. And Xenophon quotes a famous apologue of his called The Choice of Heracles, breathing the very spirit of naturalistic ethics. In particular, it harmonizes admirably with the lines quoted above from Euripides by showing that pleasure must either be purchased by toil or paid for by premature exhaustion. 8. Natural Law as the Right of the Stronger It will be remembered that Heraclitus brought the laws of the state into connection with the great cosmic law as the source whence their energy is derived. This idea was afterwards taken up and developed by the Stoics, who also adopted the physical philosophy of Heraclitus as the foundation of their system. Now, as the central precept of Stoicism is follow nature, an obvious summary of what Hippias and Prodicus taught, we may legitimately regard these two sophists as worthy successors in the ethical field to the great Ephesian master. Their appeal to nature was not, however, to pass unchallenged. If, as seems more than possible, Protagoras first turned author in his later years, his proscription of physical studies and his theory of morality as a purely human product may well be interpreted as a criticism of the attempt made by his younger rivals to found morality on natural law, more especially as their ethical method was soon twisted in a way that must have revolted them into a justification of the claim put forward on behalf of the stronger, whether as states or as individuals, to plunder and destroy the weaker. Thucydides represents the Athenians as openly basing their foreign policy on the law of brute force, and it has been supposed that their cynical declarations in this respect, as well as the private demoralization described in their own literature, was the result of sophistic teaching. Only since the last hundred years has it been made clear, chiefly by the labors of English scholars, that neither as humanists nor as naturalists can the sophists be justly charged with any such corrupting influence. Their principles were liable to be misrepresented or misapplied, as are the principles of any philosophy, and we may add of any religion, but to no greater extent than has happened, for instance, with the lessons of their great opponent Plato. On the whole, the new ideas they put in circulation were distinctly a gain to Greece and to the world. 9. Gorgias the Anti-Naturalist Gorgias of Leontini, a Sicilian teacher of rhetoric, counts among the great sophists while occupying a place somewhat apart from the three above considered. His principal contribution to philosophy, however, seems to associate him more nearly with Protagoras than with the naturalist couple. It is, in fact, a bold attempt to get rid of the idea of nature altogether by showing that there is no such thing. Gorgias conducts his campaign against objective reality in the paradoxical Greek style by establishing three propositions. 1. Nothing is. 2. If anything existed, it could not be known. 3. If it could be known, the knowledge could not be communicated for what contradicts itself cannot exist. And the philosophers have proved with equal cogency that nature is one and many, finite and infinite, with and without change. To be known, reality should be identified with thought, whereas some thoughts evidently represent nothing real. Nor can knowledge be communicated unless words are identified with the sensations they signify which is not the fact. As regards virtue, Gorgias taught that it is relative to the age and social position of the person concerned, a principle that reminds us of the short modern formula for conduct, my station and its duties. 10. 
abolitionism. It was quite in consonance with the humanist spirit that Agathon, a disciple of Gorgias, should make justice a result of mutual agreement among men, rather than an image of mathematical equality, and that another of his disciples, Alcidamus, should call the laws the bulwark of the city, and philosophy the bulwark of the laws. Yet this reverence for human law, which all over the ancient world upheld slavery as a permanent social institution, did not prevent the same Alcidamus from declaring slavery illegitimate. God, according to him, sent all men to be free. Nature made none a slave. That is the greatest, most pregnant word of Greek practical philosophy. Plato and Aristotle never got so far. Aristotle even explicitly denied that for one man to treat another as an animated tool was wrong. To accomplish so great an effort of thought, it seems to have been necessary that the two principles which the two rival schools of sophisticism had opposed to one another should be combined, that the ideal of nature should be recognized in the completed humanity of man. End of section 11. Section 12 of Early Greek Philosophy by Alfred William Benn. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 5. Socrates, Part 1. 1. Personality. Socrates is the greatest name in the history of philosophy, and at the same time its most popular and most familiar figure. J. A. Simmons tells us how the sight of a hemlock plant recalled the manner of his death to a Venetian gondolier. The charm of his personality is unique. We think of the Greek philosophers before and after him as of so many marble statues, but of him as a living, speaking human figure. Yet this figure is surrounded by a sort of mystery. It is still a question, for what did he live and die? An enigma to his own age, he remains an enigma to us. If Plato may be trusted, he was even an enigma to himself. From that fame and that obscurity, one fact at least emerges to begin with, the immense importance of the personal factor in his work, whatever the value of that work may turn out to be. 2. Sources of Information Socrates himself never wrote a line about philosophy, and although numerous reports of his conversation have been preserved, it is doubtful whether any two consecutive sentences have been put down exactly as they were uttered. Nor can the numerous busts bearing his name be relied on as faithful copies of an original portrait. It is suspected that they merely reproduce the conventional mask of Silenus mentioned by those who remembered him, as giving a good idea of the sage's unprepossessing features. We know that he was born about 469 B.C., and that by family and fortune he belonged to the poorer class of Athenian citizens, his father being a working sculptor and his mother a midwife. But the incidents of his early life are buried in deep obscurity. It would seem that he practiced his father's trade for a time and then abandoned it in order to devote himself exclusively to the cultivation of his own and of other people's intelligence. Before the age of forty, Socrates must have already gained a high reputation for wisdom, for we find the beautiful, gifted, and aristocratic Alcibiades frequenting his society as a fitting preparation for filling the highest political offices. Some ten years later, Aristophanes, in his comedy The Clouds, already mentioned as a brilliant satire on the new culture, takes Socrates as a type of the whole sophistic movement. An eager student of physical science, a dishonest atheist, and a corrupter of the youths who come to him for instruction. Plato, writing long afterwards, puts into the mouth of Socrates 
an explicit repudiation of ever having been engaged in physical speculations and in this respect he is fully borne out by the evidence of xenophon a fellow disciple we may take their word for it without excluding the possibility that their master had gone into such studies enough to convince himself that for him at any rate they would be a waste of time he was no less a genuine athenian than aristophanes and except as a fashionable craze for a short period physics never appealed to the attic taste nor did it owe at any time a single discovery to attic genius like protagoras socrates devoted himself to human interests but unlike the great agnostic he shared the strong religious faith which nowhere had struck such deep roots as in attic soil and this faith stood high among the causes alienating him and his countrymen from the method of hippias and prodicus three not a sophist on the strength of his reputation as a teacher socrates was popularly classed among the sophists his intimate friends however justly insisted on the fundamental difference separating him from them it consisted to begin with in the circumstance that the sophists took pay and that he did not quite apart from the direct evidence of plato and xenophon who only knew him late in life we may gather as much from the satire of aristophanes on his poverty-stricken appearance a fact absolutely inconsistent with his making a trade of tuition the profession of sophist was indeed considered more lucrative than honourable and an athenian citizen may well have considered it beneath his dignity to barter wisdom for gold especially in the case of one's own countrymen whom it seemed a sort of natural duty to help with advice protagoras and the others were strangers with something of the discredit attaching to foreign adventurers about them socrates never left his native city except on military duty which he performed as a heavy armed foot soldier in three arduous campaigns on one occasion saving the life of alcibiades four irony supposing however that the position of the paid teacher at athens had been not less dignified than that of a salaried professor among ourselves still it was one that socrates would have scrupled to assume it would have been dishonest on his part to take money for teaching because by his account he had nothing to teach our authorities are not agreed as to what was meant by this profession of universal ignorance the socratic irony as it is called plato gives it a strong religious colouring according to his story an ardent admirer of socrates one chirophon asked the oracle at delphi was there any man wiser than he the pythian prophetess answered that there was no man wiser much surprised at being singled out for such a distinction and conscious of not in the least deserving it socrates went about seeking for some one wiser than himself but found none even among those whose reputation stood highest for their pretended wisdom invariably broke down under his cross-examination while at the same time he could not convince them that they knew no more than he did then at last the meaning of the oracle became plain wisdom belongs to the gods alone no man knows anything and he is wisest who has come to the consciousness of his own ignorance one is sorry to question such a beautiful story but like the athenian celebrities it breaks down under cross-examination socrates could not have got so great a reputation as is here presupposed without some more positive achievement than a general confession of ignorance and as depicted by xenophon in this respect a much more trustworthy informant than plato it is only about natural philosophy that he professes to know nothing or to hold that nothing can be known the causes of physical phenomena being in his opinion a secret that the gods have kept to themselves on the other hand 
the whole range of human interests lies open to man and among the rest to himself five the dialectic method in limiting philosophy to the study of man socrates agrees with protagoras except that he approaches the subject from a religious rather than from an agnostic point of view the distinctive originality of the athenian thinker lies in his creation of a new method socrates figures in the history of philosophy before all things as the founder of logic the first to attempt an organization of reason as such reasoning of course is as old as language in a way it is as old as conscious life the behavior of the most rudimentary animals is guided by their experience of the past and long before socrates the greeks had learned to distinguish this power from all the lower manifestations of consciousness to look on it as constituting their own superiority to the barbarians the secret also of one man's superiority to another in the state then came philosophy and raised reason to a higher pinnacle still as the cause alike of physical order and of civil law the ruling power of the world as such anaxagoras had introduced it to athens under the name of nous the one greek word still known to the most ignorant sporting man among ourselves another greek word for reason the one used by heraclitus is logos whence comes our word logic which means the science of reasoning the analysis of its operations the systematic exposure of the process by which conception judgment and inference are successfully carried on socrates did not create the science of logic that was an achievement reserved for his successor aristotle but without his pioneer work it could not have been created how much he actually did we cannot tell with certainty for xenophon to whom our most trustworthy information is due had but a feeble hold on pure theory and plato's dramatic presentation of the old master gives such an immense extension to his method that the original nucleus cannot be isolated from subsequent accretions six definition we know on the authority of aristotle confirmed by the detailed statements of xenophon that socrates first introduced the method of definition and induction that is he took some abstract term by preference the name of a virtue or vice such as courage or justice cowardice or injustice and by comparing together a number of concrete instances where those qualities were exhibited sought to arrive at a general notion of what the word meant of what we now call its connotation according to him such a procedure was necessary in order that discussions on subjects of general interest might be carried on in a friendly and profitable manner and not only were definitions necessary in order that people might know what they were talking about but the definitions themselves were to be arrived at as the result of a search jointly undertaken by the whole company everybody present helping to the best of his ability in the hunt after truth socrates in fact applied the democratic tradition of athens to scientific inquiry not speaking with authority as the sophists but as professing to know no more than any one else more concerned to ask questions than to answer them always on the lookout for new facts and new ideas his method reflected both the deliberations of the sovereign assembly and the cross-examination to which defendants could subject their prosecutors in the popular law courts of course athens even more than other greek cities abounded in persons having a good conceit of themselves and pretenders to universal knowledge found a merciless critic in the poorly dressed old man with the thick lips and flat turned-up nose who under the appearance of reverence for their superior wisdom and an insatiable thirst for information by a series of searching questions speedily involved the pontifical charlatan in a mesh of hopeless self-contradiction 
such scenes no doubt suggested to plato his imposing picture of socrates as a divinely commissioned prophet going about to convince the world of universal and hopeless ignorance as prophets of another school go about to convince it of universal depravity but the picture as it stands is not historical and the real prophet had a message of reasoned truth rather than of reasoned nescience to deliver seven division more important even than definition to clear thinking is the logical process of division the distribution of every subject discussed under a number of distinct headings descartes the founder of modern french philosophy mentions the plan of breaking up difficulties into the greatest possible number of parts as a first step to discovering their solution and the same method was practised by socrates two thousand years before him if for instance he were discussing the comparative claims of two rival statesmen to the name of a good citizen he would bring down the question to a specific estimate of their respective services in the various departments of political activity a good citizen increases the resources of the state defeats the enemy in war wins allies by diplomacy appeases intestine discords by his eloquence eight reasoning definition and division are spoken of in logic as processes subsidiary to inference that is the discovery of new truths as necessary consequences of the truths we already know socrates was fully alive to this characteristic property of reasoning and illustrated it in his conversations by starting from principles about which he and his interlocutor were agreed unfortunately xenophon on account of his very narrow range of interests does not quote examples enough to show how socrates habitually worked out his conclusions but he gives us the valuable information that no man whom he ever knew was so successful in gaining the assent of his hearers a fact quite inconsistent with plato's account of his hero as an exasperating personage reducing every one to shame if not to confession by his dialectical skill End of section twelve section thirteen of early greek philosophy by alfred william ben this LibriVox recording is in the public domain, read by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 5, Socrates, Part 2. 9. Final Causes As it happens, the most celebrated instance of Socratic reasoning is one that modern science has shown to be much less convincing than used to be imagined. This is the well-known theistic argument from design as the structure of the human body exhibits an adaptation of means to ends such as we find in the works of skilful artificers the existence of a powerful intelligent and benevolent being is assumed as necessary to explain its origin whatever the argument may be worth the credit of having discovered it clearly belongs to socrates for anaxagoras who comes nearest to him as a theistic philosopher conceived his noose as working by mechanical impulse not by design and if there is any truth in the story of the oracle declaring him to be the wisest of men we may suppose that it was due to the impression made on the delphic authorities by his fame as the contributor of a new reason for believing in the gods at a time when philosophers in general passed for being atheists as to the socratic profession of ignorance we are now in a better position to appreciate its value it is a paradoxical way of saying that the logician as such need know nothing that commonly passes for knowledge by exposing the flaws in other people's theories he may prove that they are as ignorant as he is himself or again by unfolding the implications of the facts supplied to him by other people while securing their assent to every step in the chain of inference he may make it seem as if the result obtained did as much credit to their wisdom as to his own 
this is the method constantly followed by the platonic socrates who in this respect may reproduce the spirit of the master more faithfully than xenophon's photographic illustrations ten socrates as a moral reformer while socrates interests us chiefly as the creator of logical method the philosopher himself only valued that method as an instrument of moral reformation as an athenian citizen he took a profound personal interest in the good government of his country and this patriotic motive was alone sufficient to distinguish him from the sophists who as paid teachers and foreigners could not be actuated by the same absorbing passion for the public good at the same time it is clear that their comparative detachment and wide range of culture gave their ethical ideas a reach an originality and an emancipating power that his did not possess the humanism of protagoras was pregnant with hopes of a higher civilization than greece had reached the naturalism of hippias and prodicus embodied a reaction against perverted appetites from which greece in less civilized ages had been free eleven utilitarianism in accordance with the systematizing bent of his genius socrates seems to have sought for a single principle in ethics and to have found it provisionally in the idea of utility that is to say he introduced the method of estimating the morality of actions neither by public opinion nor by individual taste but by their calculable consequences we must not suppose however that his attempts in this direction amounted to an anticipation of utilitarianism in the modern sense as reported by xenophon he never commits himself to the assertion that pleasure and the absence of pain are the only desirable things nor assuming that we have discovered in what utility consists whether pleasurableness or anything else does socrates ever make it clear whether the conduct of the individual is to be determined by regard for his own advantage or for the advantage of the community to which he belongs or for that of the whole human race that these respective claims might apparently at least collide was a difficulty first seriously discussed in all its bearings by plato who only hoped to solve it by revolutionizing public opinion society and religion socrates habitually appeals to self-interest as if it were the only available motive but he seems at the same time to be persuaded that the happiness of the citizen is in the long run identified with the happiness of the state that in fact was not his question but rather the question how an art of social life could be constructed comparable for systematic completeness to the industrial arts of which a city like athens offered such multifarious examples twelve the lessons of town life aristophanes could not see the soul of socrates but he has taken a snapshot of the philosopher as he appeared to the man in the street the accuracy of which is vouched for by plato stalking about like a pelican and rolling his eyes nothing escaped those curious eyes as nothing escaped mr gladstone's and their inquisitiveness found a rich harvest in a city where every calling was taught and practised with complete publicity now what struck socrates chiefly was the high value set on expert attainments and the ready obedience given to professional trainers wherever a special technique had come to be recognised as in the army and navy the theatre the artist's studio or the gymnasium compared with the haphazard methods of politics of the higher education of social intimacies of pleasure-seeking among the leisured classes that any one should follow for his personal satisfaction a line of conduct which would not be tolerated for a day in the hired occupants of a responsible office seemed to the philosopher a revolting paradox some may call this a bourgeois or philistine morality 
but what makes those names terms of reproach is their association with a slavish deference to custom and tradition socratic morality by reducing life to a fine art discards convention and opens possibilities of endless improvement thirteen virtue as knowledge greek philosophy delighted in paradoxes and socrates was credited with two such first the paradox of ignorance which as we saw expressed in a picturesque way the discovery of fact by talking things over methodically the evolution of logical processes of the unknown into the known and secondly the paradox that virtue is identical with knowledge so that he who has the right theory of conduct necessarily does what is right every one said socrates does what he thinks is for his good if he does wrong that only proves that he is mistaken in his belief and ought to be taught better such an idea is closely connected with the interpretation of morality as an art the artist has in fact been defined as one who does his best and it might be said that the man who scamps his work has mistaken beliefs about the good of making money or the good of saving time the question ends by becoming a verbal one if my friend tells me that he does what he knows is bad for him and i observe that if he really knew that he would not do it we are evidently not using the word no in the same sense or to put it somewhat differently the socratic philosophy which began as ultra intellectualism ends in what would now be called ultra pragmatism belief does not lead to practice it is practice and nothing else fourteen the divine voice socrates did not succeed in reducing his own life to a work of art capable of being explained and justified as the expression of right theory in right practice a place had to be left for the free play of unaccountable instincts or intuitions warning him without a reason that certain actions would have bad results he interpreted these inward monitions as a divine voice accompanying him through life by a misinterpretation which goes back to his own time this voice has often been described as a demon or personal spirit more recently it has been identified with conscience but this view is inconsistent with the circumstance mentioned by plato that the monitor always intervened to forbid never to give a positive command conscience both forbids and commands while in each instance its promptings can be referred to the known laws of moral obligation fifteen the hero as a philosopher with socrates himself to know the right and to do it were the same thing and no doubt it was from a conviction that what was possible for him was equally possible to all men that he identified virtue with knowledge for the unflinching performance of duty at all costs he is so far as our information goes without an equal in the ancient world his services as a soldier in the field have already been mentioned his conduct as a citizen at home is marked by still greater fortitude it was his custom at the bidding as he declared of the divine monitor to abstain from all political activity but there came a moment when a civic duty accidentally imposed on the philosopher showed of what metal he was made athens had won her last great victory over a peloponnesian fleet at arginusae but to her people the victory became an occasion for mourning and indignation because through the neglect as was alleged of the admirals a number of sailors had been left to perish in the waves and what seemed still worse the bodies of the dead were not picked up and brought home for burial it was therefore resolved that the admirals who returned home six in number should be tried on this charge so far no objection could be taken to the proceedings the case was altered when the senate accepted a resolution decreeing that the guilt or innocence of the accused parties should be submitted to a direct vote of the whole people instead of a regular sworn jury 
that they should not be heard in their own defence, and that their cases should be decided in a batch, instead of being submitted one by one to the popular judgment, as was prescribed by law. At first, the Prytanies, a sort of municipal board whose business it was to preside over the deliberations of the sovereign assembly, refused to commit the illegality of putting the question to the vote, but eventually all, with a single exception, yielded to the clamour of the multitude. That solitary representative of law and justice was Socrates, whom the chances of the lot had enrolled among the Prytanies of that day. His protest could not be overcome by threats of imprisonment and death, but being eventually passed over, it was powerless to save the unfortunate victors of Argonusi from condemnation and execution. Two years after these events, the democracy that had so abused its power was abolished by a foreign conqueror, and an oligarchy of thirty members imposed on Athens. These men soon inaugurated a reign of terror, killing and plundering to their heart's content. Within the city, one voice alone was raised in fearless criticism of their insane violence, this time also the voice of Socrates. Critias, the leader of the terrorists, had been his pupil, and was content to let the old philosopher off with a private warning to hold his tongue. Socrates also braved an insidious attempt of the thirty to make him an accomplice in their crimes. A certain Leon of Salamis, whose only offence was his wealth, had been marked out by them for proscription. Five citizens, of whom Socrates was one, received orders to arrest this man and bring him over to be executed. The other four went on the disgraceful errand. He remained at home. 16. Trial and Death of Socrates It was reserved for the restored democracy to commit a crime from which even the cruel and unscrupulous oligarchs had recoiled. In the year 399 B.C., Socrates was prosecuted on a capital charge before the popular tribunal of Anitus, a democratic politician, Lycon, a public speaker, and Melitus, a poet. They accused him of denying the gods whom the state acknowledged, of introducing new gods whom the state did not acknowledge, and of being a corrupter of youth. In short, they represented the greatest and purest religious teacher Greece had ever seen, of being an immoral and superstitious atheist. Athens, as has already been mentioned, was distinguished above all other Greek cities for intolerant bigotry. So far the victims of persecution had been philosophers whose ideas were irreconcilable with the current mythology, such as Anaxagoras and Protagoras, or who openly criticized it, as Diagoras of Melos. But what makes the habit of punishing people for their opinions so peculiarly poisonous is that sooner or later it victimizes originality of every kind, even the originality that finds new arguments for old beliefs. Socrates incurred the suspicion of atheism simply because he met the atheists on their own ground, encountering reason with reason, and because he betrayed a thorough acquaintance with the theories he set himself to refute. To describe his divinely sent warnings as a new-fangled religion was, of course, a misconception that a few words of explanation would dispel. A pamphleteer who renewed the attack on Socrates some years after his death supported the charge of corrupting youth by the examples of Alcibiades and Critias. Both had been his pupils, and both had turned out badly. But as Xenophon truly observes, whatever influence Socrates exercised over them was used to keep them straight, not to lead them astray. Plato's account of his master's trial and death is a historical romance, but the main facts may be taken as faithfully related, the court which sat in judgment on Socrates consisted of 501 citizens chosen by lot. It seems to have made a bad impression on many of these persons that the old philosopher appealed to their reason instead of humbly throwing himself on their mercy, 
which in Xenophon's opinion would have ensured his acquittal. Condemned by a small majority and invited to propose a lighter penalty than the capital sentence demanded by his accuser, Socrates began by suggesting that maintenance at the public expense in the Pritaneum would be the proper recompense for the services he had rendered to the state. Then, waiving this claim as impracticable, he offered to pay a fine of thirty minae, about a hundred and twenty-two pounds, as his friends would be willing to make up that much money among them. On a second vote, the fearless old man was condemned to death, eighty of those who had pronounced him innocent now going over to the side of the majority. It so happened that the condemnation fell at a time when, owing to the absence of a sacred mission sent to Delos, no capital sentence could be carried out at Athens. This gave a respite of thirty days to Socrates, who, had he chosen, might have profited by the delay to make his escape from prison. Everything had, in fact, been arranged for the purpose by his friends, but he refused to avail himself of their offers, on the ground that it would have involved disobedience to the laws. Accordingly, on the expiration of the fatal term, after a last conversation with his followers, Socrates cheerfully met death in the way humanely prescribed at Athens, by swallowing a draught of hemlock. We owe it to the method and the example of this heroic sage, first, that philosophy has ever since centered in the study of mind, rather than in the study of matter, and also that it has been understood to demand, so far as human frailty permits, a realization in its teachers' lives of the ideal that their moral theories set up. Hence the later schools of Greek philosophy, while more largely indebted to the Ionian cosmologists and to the sophists than to Socrates for their speculative principles, exhibit in the character and attitude of their founders and chief representatives the unmistakable impress of his commanding personality. End of section 13. Read by Pamela Nagami, M.D., in Encino, California, October 2023. End of Early Greek Philosophy by Alfred William Benn.